My name is Penny Dreadful. A deceptive calm hovers over the great estate, but the sinister stillness may obscure an unmentionable evil that can only lead to terror at Collinwood. Welcome to episode four of Terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Penny Dreadful. Say it in the mirror three times backwards if you dare, but not between like two and three. I'm usually busy during that time. I am here today with a very special guest and I am super excited to have him here with me. He is a writer. He is a Dark Shadows historian and pop culture collector and a legendary figure in the Dark Shadows fandom. He recently retired from teaching English at Tennessee State University. University, where he started in 1985, and he continues to write articles about education, film, television, comic books, music, and popular culture for magazines, books, and websites. He's the Rondo Award-nominated author of the television horrors of Dan Curtis, Dark Shadows, The Night Stalker, and other productions, 1966 to 2006, published by McFarland, and Knights of Dan Curtis, the television epics of the Dark Shadows auteur, published by Ideas Into Books. He also wrote House of Dan Curtis, the television mysteries of the Dark Shadows auteur. He was the weekend announcer on Nashville's WAMBAM 1200 from 1981 to 2006. His master's thesis was about the historical novels of Dan Marilyn Ross, and he's written the detailed introductions for the Hermes Press Gold Key Comics collections. Uh, this man has been an active participant in fandom for decades. He taught me the uh, F Firewall. 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 I A W O L. <laughs> fandom is a way of life. Fandom is a way of life. Yes. Uh, I still have his publication, The Dark Shadows Comic Books from 1988, which I love and read many times. He was heavily involved as the co founder, an actor, and writer with the Collinsport Players, who uh, performed comedic Dark Shadows-themed plays at the Dark Shadows festivals, where he also emceed guest panels and events at the con. And I'm sure I'm leaving out about a hundred other amazing things about my guest today. It is my great honor to welcome Dr. Jeff Thompson. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much, Penny. I am thrilled to be here with you. I've seen tapes and DVDs of some of your uh, TV shows, and I remember when you collaborated with Dr. Gangreen, Nashville's horror host, on a TV special. So I'm delighted to be here with you to talk about Dark Shadows. Well, thank you very much. And of course, Dr. Gangreen is also a big Dark Shadows fan. I'll have to, to bring him on here at some point. But first, I want to I want to dive in here by talking about your introduction to Dark Shadows. When did you first discover Dark Shadows and what was it about the show that captivated you? Like many fans, I did not see the show from the very beginning. I did not see those pre Barnabas episodes until they came out on MPI home video. But in late September of 1967, when I was in the third grade, I was homesick from school one day and I was turning the dial and I happened upon an episode of Dark Shadows. And coincidentally, it's uh, the first scene I saw is the very first scene on MPI Home Video's compilation, The Best of Dark Shadows. And it certainly was for me. It was a, a scene in which David is having a dream and he dreams that he and Sarah are in the basement of the old house and they see a coffin. The mm -hmm. coffin lid opens and out comes the vampire Barnabas Collins. So naturally I was hooked immediately. The two little kids were about my age and I liked, you know, the mystery and atmosphere. And so I started watching from then on and, uh, collected the Dark Shadows memorabilia along the way and read all of uh, Dan Ross's Dark Shadows novels and all of the Gold Key comic books. And I made the models and played the records and everything. And uh, then starting in the 70s, when I was a teenager, I wrote for several Dark Shadows fanzines, uh, especially Kathy Resch's fanzine, The World of Dark Shadows. Yes. Um, and then later started writing for other fanzines and magazines like Scarlet Street, Film Facts, uh, Midnight Marquee, Mad About Movies, and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, more recently, I wrote the introductions to the Hermes Press books that 
are reprinting the Dark Shadows comic books. And then I wrote three books about producer-director Dan Curtis, who created Dark Shadows. And he also did the Night Stalker trilogy of terror, Burnt Offerings, The Winds of War. Mm-hmm. And uh, those uh, books are now in, a, uh, in revised second editions, which uh, have been updated and, and uh, you know, I've added more uh, information. The more I study Dan Curtis and his productions, the more I learn. And so I wanted to put even more into the second editions of the books. Fantastic. Now, you're you're also a big uh, collector. You mentioned your childhood collecting of, of painting of the Dark Shadows model kits and the bubblegum cards. And so t- tell us a little bit about your collection. Uh, you not only collect Dark Shadows, you collect a variety of things, but Dark Shadows seems to be your sort of primary collection, but I'm curious to hear about that. Yes. Most of my Dark Shadows collectibles are from the late 1960s when I was lucky enough to find the board game, the Barnabas Collins game, the Viewmaster set, the comic books, the the gum cards, the models, which I built, and uh, the books, records, uh, everything like that. Uh, along the way, I've been able to find some of the more rare items, but I don't have everything. I've never had those um, horror head pillows yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> that are so rare. Uh, but I have a Josette's music box and uh, the movie posters and and uh, autographed stills from the TV show and the movies. And uh, Do you oh, have the, uh, the Halloween costume, the, the Barnabas Halloween costume? I, I got the mask, the oh, wow. just the plastic mask with the string on the back. Back then, you know, I found it at a 10 cent store. I never knew that there was a full costume, that there was a little apron that went with it in a box until, I guess, the 80s or 90s when I, uh, you know, started getting into the fandom and going to the conventions. And so, no, I, I, I've never had that complete costume, but I have had the uh, the mask itself uh, all wow. these years and, and, and went, wore it when I went trick-or-treating one year. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and and I have the the Don Post Studios old vampire right. mask, the over-the-head mask. Mm-hmm. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, I have uh, I have a lot of Dark Shadows collectibles as well, but, you know, there's, there, it's sort of a, a bottomless well of, of opportunity in terms of finding these, these uh, treasures, you know, and I, I've been collecting Dark Shadows uh, collectibles for years, memorabilia. And then I went through a period where I needed to make a few bucks and I sold some of it. And I think all collectors do that. Like you go through a period where like, oh, I got to, I have to sell this to get this. And then of course there's the regret a couple of years later, I shouldn't have sold that, you know, but um, I'm always kind of on the lookout for, for those things. Um, so today I'd like to talk with you. It's, it's appropriate that your introduction to Dark Shadows uh, in September 67 was the uh, Barnabas storyline just shortly before they went into 1795, because today I'd like to talk uh, with you about that iconic storyline, that pivotal uh, storyline in the series. Prior to Barnabas, we had uh, Laura Collins, which we talked about in the last episode, and the Laura Phoenix storyline sort of set the stage for Barnabas because she was the first supernatural villain in the show. And so Dan Curtis famously tells the story that his kids Uh, you know, his daughter said, daddy, make it scary, make it really scary. And he thought about what the scariest thing was that he could think of. And he thought back to his childhood, because of course, Dan Curtis was a big horror movie fan. He loved the Universal films, correct? Yes, he did. Yeah. And so uh, he loved Dracula and the scariest monster he could think of was a vampire so he said let's let's go all the way with this let's do a vampire and boy what a what a wonderful stroke of genius that was to introduce uh, a vampire so we had Shakespearean actor Jonathan Frid trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts at Yale University, a Canadian actor, and uh, was cast in the role of Barnabas. He <laughs> he tells a great story. About he, um, he had just done a play with Ray Milland, and he went to the audition, and there were uh, a group of actors in there. He said there were a group of uh, cadaverous-looking uh, actors in there, and he said, I out-cadavered them all, apparently. <laughs> and right. he, he was cast uh, in the role famously. And uh, Jonathan Frid had such a presence about him, a gravitas and an otherworldly old world charm to him, a sad 
romantic quality there, but also uh, an edge. He could be very sinister and frightening. Uh, I had terrible nightmares about Barnabas when I was a child, and he could be very unpredictable, and he became a pop culture sensation. He captivated uh, the audience, and while the ratings started to go up every time Dan Curtis would put a ghost in, you know, or put the, the, the Laura storyline, they'd go tick up, it'd go up a tick. But when they did the vampire, that's when it became a big hit. And we first see Barnabas when he's released from the coffin by Willie Loomis, uh, brought to Collinwood by Jason McGuire, first played by James Hall. And then of course, by John Carlin, who everyone loved the late uh, John Carlin, sadly passed away a little bit, a little over a year ago, I think. Yes. And so, um, um, so what was it, uh, what would you say, uh, looking at the storyline, the beginning of this storyline when Willie releases Barnabas from the coffin? So what's your, what is your feeling in terms of why this became such a, I guess, a success? It was something so new and different. Um, mm -hmm. uh, nothing like that had ever been done on daytime television and, and mm -hmm. rarely on nighttime. So when Willie re, uh, opened that chained coffin and the, the hand uh, uh, came out, I'm sure it, it was a, a big jolt to all of the viewers, especially the little kids my age uh, who would have been watching. So um, as Dan Curtis uh, recalls, he, he was just looking for the next storyline. You know, he mm. had had success with the ghosts who overcame uh, Matthew Morgan and uh, the Laura Phoenix fire creature story. So he was he was just looking for the next scary monster to keep the show going a little while longer. But he he said he was planning uh, to keep the vampire as a character only for about a cycle, meaning 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they would go on to something else. I, I wonder what the what the show would have done if that had remained the plan. And um, Dan Curtis used the word marauder. Uh, to describe both his initial uh, idea of Barnabas Collins and the way Jack Palance played Dracula yes. in his um, production of Dracula later. Uh, so Barnabas, even though he had the the very charming courtly side to him, that that was that was just part of his villainy at the beginning. He he was meant to be the the next monster on the show, and eventually perhaps would have uh, someone would have driven a stake through his heart or who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. But Jonathan Frid played the part in such a, a charismatic and, and melancholy and multifaceted way that he started getting fan mail. Jonathan Frid tells the story of uh, one day he was at the studio and Dan Curtis came up to him and, and gave him a few letters and Jonathan said, oh, I must be in trouble or is this my pink slip? But it was a few fan letters. And then the next week, even more letters came and more and more. And finally, Jonathan had to, to hire people and ask for volunteers among the Dark Shadows viewers to help him with all of the fan mail. Mm -hmm. So Dan Curtis realized, well, I've, I have struck gold here with this character of Barnabas Collins, so I can't kill him off. But as Curtis said, how do I perpetuate a vampire? Especially when at the beginning of the storyline, Barnabas has done some horrible things to Maggie and oh, Willie. Gosh, yeah. um, so like many soap opera characters who start out as bad characters or villains or do bad things. But if they are hits with the fans, sometimes those characters are reformed or softened in some way to varying degrees of success. And this is what happened successfully with Barnabas. Yes, he did do terrible things when he came to the present time and, and throughout the, the series, really. Yeah. But we began to learn more of his motivations and much more of his regret. You know, we, we've called Barnabas Collins the reluctant vampire for many, many decades. And that idea was, was fairly new and new to vampirism and yeah. movies and TV vampires at that time. A little bit of it had been done with the Wolfman and with uh, House of Dracula and House of Frankenstein and sure. a few, a little bit in the Universal Monster movies. But now in the, the current time of the 1960s, the idea of a, uh, of a regretful, sorrowful vampire uh, was, was something new and different. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Jonathan and Fred always said, I played Barnabas like an alcoholic and like a liar. He said, I, I didn't play him like a vampire. I didn't play up the bite necessarily. That was part of it. But what I played was he, he, he was a guy with, with a, a, an, an addiction and, yeah. or a mm-hmm. hang up uh, like an alcoholic who is forced to do what he does. And he and Jonathan also said, I played the part as a liar. He says to me, the scariest Mm -hmm. person in the world, the most horror you would find is a liar, because once he starts lying, he has to keep up the lie and he has to keep doing more and more things to to cover up and 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 keep his lie going. And so that provides an unpredictability and and horror to the character. So um, and then uh, Dan Curtis and the writers decided, well, why don't we go back in time and show Barnabas when he was living as a, a mortal man before he became a vampire and and let's show the the fans how he became a vampire. And that would that would continue to cast him in a more sympathetic light uh, Mm -hmm. if we would see how the curse of the vampire came upon him. So, um, you know, if Barnabas had been dispatched after 13 weeks, I wonder what would have happened on the show next. Would there have been a werewolf or would there have been been another ghost or would the show have been canceled or would the show have ever done time travel? Maybe if there had been no Barnabas, the show might have gone back in time sooner or later to show us the story of Josette and Jeremiah, Maybe both so. of whom were mentioned in the very first week mm-hmm. of the show. So uh, they, th- those were established ancestor characters long before Barnabas came along and the writers connected Barnabas to those characters. So I just, we don't know what uh, would have happened. I but think there's a hint um, when we're watching Vicky and Burke look at the house by the sea, there's, they seem to be seeding in the start of a, of a potential storyline there, uh, you know, and, but it never, it never, you know, manifests. They, they, they kind of start down that road and then it just kind of, they let go of it probably because they saw Barnabas was the Barnabas storyline was very popular. And they said, well, let's keep doing this instead is my guess. I don't, I don't know if that would have kind of segged into that storyline or not. Yes, I believe so, Penny. I have often thought about that story that didn't seem to go anywhere, Seaview, the house by the sea. And um, I remember in one of the episodes when, when she, uh, when Vicky and Burke, and I think maybe Barnabas too, were in the house, Vicky looks out the window at the sea and says, I can almost see an old sailing ship out yes. there. Mm-hmm. So I got the idea that maybe they were planning to let the house be a time portal and she would go back in time through the house. Oh, they wow. didn't use that. But later in the show, they used a variation on that when uh, the room in the East Wing was the portal to parallel time. Right. So so there are quite a few of those little storylines that start but don't seem to, to go anywhere. But mm-hmm. the writers, you know, got other ideas. And Dan Curtis was very, very participatory in the writing of the show and everything, the, sure. the, the lighting, the set decorating, the casting everything. And so uh, he contributed many ideas. And it was said when he got bored with an idea or what one of the storylines was, he changed it. That perhaps accounts for why the stories often begin and end so abruptly. Right. (laughs) Unlike other soap operas, you can really point to the exact episode where something ends or something begins. Sure. um, Kind of like a newspaper comic strip, Mm -hmm. which Dark Shadows uh, later became. But yes, um, the the character of Barnabas Collins became more and more sympathetic as uh, as the character went along. But at the beginning, he, he was quite vicious uh the way he treated willie and beat him and and the horrible way that he uh held maggie captive uh, right, you know, right. back then i guess especially to little kids watching it it was just make believe but now uh in real life we have heard of so many oh, horrible yeah. horror stories that happen in real life of of people abusing other people and holding them captive. And so it's yeah. the storyline is 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 not doesn't have that sure. same luster of, oh, it's only make-believe. It's right. just an exciting story now right. when we look back at it. 
And uh, yeah, I, this was the first storyline. I, I was familiar with Dark Shadows. I, I don't remember a time when I didn't know what Dark Shadows was because as I mentioned in the first episode, my uncle Valdemar, uh, my uncle Val introduced me to the show as a very young child through Famous Monsters of Filmland uh, magazine and his bubblegum cards. And he'd always talk about Barnabas and do imitations of Barnabas. So I knew who Barnabas was was my fourth grade teacher. I remember she asked the class that we had a student in my class named Jeff Collins. And one day she called on him and she called him Barnabas. And she asked the class, does anybody know who Barnabas is? Barnabas Collins. And I raised my hand. I was like, he's a vampire, you know? So but the first time I watched Dark Shadows was in syndication. My uncle acquired some videotapes from syndication from the 80s, from something 83, 84. And uh, it was the Barnabas storyline. And I was fascinated and terrified at the same time. I was transfixed by by that storyline and had terrible nightmares about Barnabas keeping Josette captive and about when he was, you know, uh, turned his attention to David when he thought David had discovered the secret and he wanted to kill David uh, or was threatening to kill David. That, that was terrifying, you know, to that vampire wants to kill a little, a little kid. Right. That was real child abuse. That probably yeah. would not happen on a TV show today. Right, right. Uh, and so we have this character who's cut from not exactly the same cloth as Dracula, but certainly they're, they're unlike several other Dark Shadow storylines that are sort of kind of almost beat for beat adaptations in some respects, like the Adam Frankenstein storyline or the uh, Dr. Longworth and uh, John Yeager, Jekyll and Hyde storyline, which are sort of very clearly uh, those storylines. The, the Barnabas storyline is... I think there are, it's not a direct adaptation of Dracula by any means, but it's certainly, there are inspirations and echoes from Dracula that we see that the howling, the, the un, animals becoming unsettled by the presence of this unnatural being that craves blood. And he just has this very, you know, uh, refined demeanor and courtly, but he's actually, as Jonathan Frid said, an unbelievable creep underneath that, who's how he's a vampire, you know, so, yes. and with the cape and all this, but Frid started to infuse the character with a sense of longing, uh, you know, when he speaks to the portrait of Tro Josette. And I think especially when the ghost of his sister, Sarah, shows up, who sort of metaphorically is, you know, his consciousness conscience, perhaps, you know, so this, his innocence, his lost innocence, you know, and Sarah, who I love so, such a sad little character, you know, and uh, with, with that, with the flute playing and it's Bob Covert's the way he played London Bridge and with that flute or the recorder, such a sad longing to it. And Frit played into that and you started to feel for the character. I remember even as a child watching that, I, I felt scared of Barnabas, but I felt sad about Barnabas. He was doing these horrible things. I knew he was, he was doing these, he's a, he was a monster, but there was a sadness to him. And I think, you know, uh, Barnabas, the character of Barnabas certainly popularized the sympathetic vampire. Prior to that, there were two instances that come to mind was uh, Countess Zaleska in Dracula's Daughter. There was some, uh, Gloria Holden, did, you know, the, that character, you could say yes. she was sympathetic. And then prior to that, even uh, in the Penny Dreadfuls, uh, the, the Varney, Varney the Vampire was he is, I guess you would say, the first sympathetic vampire. And you even get a little bit of his origin that he was, I guess he was cursed for betraying a, a royalist to Oliver Cromwell or something. And uh, and he hates being a vampire and he ends up throwing himself into Mount Vesuvius and destroys himself. But while those vampires could be early examples of a sympathetic vampire, Barnabas was the first multi-dimensional, multi-layered portrayal of a sympathetic vampire where you fear both feared and felt for him and i the fact that he became such a pop culture icon i think changed the course of how many vampires were portrayed in literature and in, in media and film and television. Um, Anne Rice's vampires, Anne Rice was a Dark Shadows fan. Certainly her character is a Louis, the character of, of Louis, I think, or Lestat as well, owe a lot to Barnabas. And then certainly uh, as we go into sort of like Angel and, and these other types of, of or True Blood, uh, Bill Compton, I said, well, gee, that right. guy, very, I think there's a lineage there. Would you say so? I mean, would you say yes. that? Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, uh, P. N. Elrod, Patricia N. Elrod, wrote a series of novels with uh, uh, a reluctant vampire named Jonathan Barrett, mm -hmm. named for Jonathan Fred and Nancy Barrett. Of oh, House. great! <laughs> um, 
So yes, uh, I, I think that although there were antecedents, as you pointed out with Varney and others, the fact that Barnabas was on television meant that more people saw and absorbed Barnabas than perhaps had read various books or seen various movies. And uh, that's that's what catapulted him into teen idol status, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and Jonathan Fritt and later some of the other stars of Dark Shadows were in Tiger Beat and 16 and all of the teen magazines as teen idols. Mm -hmm. And um, and yes, you're right. In latter day programs, uh, all of the ones you mentioned and the short lived series Moonlight and mm -hmm. others, the vampires at least stopped and thought about what they were doing. They weren't just a, a, a mindless marauder as Dan Curtis had perhaps envisioned Barnabas, and as he and Sam Hall more or less wrote the character in the movie House of Dark Shadows, yes, uh, yes. when Barnabas is much more villainous and comes perhaps to the end that he would have met on the show if Jonathan Frid and the character had not been such breakouts. Sure. Yeah. I love House of Dark Shadows, but I know Jonathan Frid was not a fan of how Barnabas was depicted in that because he was certainly quite vicious. Um, but of course, we also have another character who goes through a transformation, uh, and that's Willie Loomis. Willie, uh, and, and I think watching the show, if you watch the pre-Barnabas episodes and go into the Barnabas episodes, you even get more of, of sort of that context of how Willie was before he was enslaved by Barnabas. Prior to that, he was a real creep, a real, uh, you know, uh, of course, played by James Hall at first, and then oh, by yes. John Carlin, really kind of unhinged and uh, very uh, dangerous, a dangerous person, for, for, along with his friend Jason McGuire, but dangerous in a different way, uh, un really unpredictable and turbulent. And so, yes. but he is humbled by Barnabas when he is goes and robs this grave and unleashes true evil. And he comes face to face with, with the undead and uh, is enslaved by Barnabas and beaten mercilessly by Barnabas and treated horribly by Barnabas. And we see Willie undergo a transformation. And it's when you first see Willie, it's like, there's no way I could ever like this character. But then you do, you start to really feel for Willie Loomis and you grow to love Willie Loomis because he becomes, he challenges Barnabas. You know, he tries to to protect Maggie. And then he becomes, over time, you have the Barnabas, Willie, and Julia dynamic. Uh, so what are your thoughts on Willie Loomis? Well, as you said, uh, James Hall started the character and, and played him in about five episodes. Mm -hmm. And I've seen many fans on Facebook pages say he was the scariest monster on the whole show <laughs> because he brought a, a, a real life, real world type of terror and danger to the show, the way he mm -hmm. tried to force himself on, on the women yeah. uh, at Collinwood and, and Carolyn even had to hold a gun on him to get away from him, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really sure why a change was made, but uh, John Carlin took over the part and continued, as you said, to be a, a, a loose cannon and a, a mostly unsympathetic character, always causing trouble at the Blue Whale and everything. But then when he becomes the first victim of the vampire and Barnabas begins biting him on the wrist mm -hmm. and draining his blood and his energy, we see Willie as a victim. He's no longer the, the monster and the predator that he was, but now he's a victim of something even more horrific than, than he and Jason mm -hmm. were. And um, then finally, you know, uh, as the story moves along and we learn that cattle have been drained of their blood, but then finally Barnabas bites other human beings and we know about it, Willie gains our sympathy because he's trapped. He, like a Renfield type character, he, you know, is completely in the thrall of the vampire and has to stay with him and has to uh, do his bidding and receives mostly ingratitude, if not physical abuse for his efforts until that sort of levels out and we don't get as much of that cruel side of Barnabas. Mm -hmm. And uh, Willie, you know, uh, throughout the show, as portrayed by John Carlin, becomes one of the most lovable characters, uh, perhaps because he, he is an everyman or and any man, you know, if you or I were in Collins Port, we we wouldn't have supernatural powers. We would be one of the humans. And and any anything that 
could happen to Willie could happen to us. You know, we, we are in danger uh, from the supernatural forces of the town. Mm-hmm. Now, Maggie Evans, of course, she uh, Barnabas moves into the old house. He kidnaps Maggie uh, and tries to turn her into Josette and gives her the music box. And she's also under his uh, his influence, his hypnotic influence and his will. You know, Barnabas, as vampires do, they can impose their will on others. And so he is transforming her into Josette and uh, at some point she finally you know tries to destroy Barnabas he's in his coffin and there's you know the scene where she's holding uh you know not a wooden stake it's a, some sort of spike that she has in her an all maybe or something like that it's a, some sort yes. of yeah mm-hmm. and she's going to destroy him and this is kind of uh Barnabas locks her in the basement here in the, in the old house so it's gone from bad to worse now no she's she's locked in this her, her life is uh, certainly in danger what were, what, what, what are your thoughts on on Maggie Evans at this point in the series like she went from being the waitress uh, at the Collinsport Diner. And now we have her as part of this uh, major story. Why, why do you think they went with uh, Vicky as the Josette character? And, and I'm sorry, Maggie, rather, instead of Vicky, who Barnabas turns his, his attentions to later when when uh, when Maggie doesn't work out, he turns his attentions to Vicky. So thoughts on that? Yes, that is unusual that, um, that Maggie was uh, the one who ended up being the supposed Josette lookalike and the, the first victim instead of Vicky, unlike the later incarnations of Dark mm-hmm. Shadows, uh, such as the 1991 series, in which at the from the start, Barnabas uh, sees Vicky as the reincarnation of Josette and pursues her. Catherine Lee Scott tells a story of how she started mm-hmm. uh, the role of Maggie in a blonde wig as, she says, a, a wisecracking Eve Arden type character. But then uh, she undergoes a, a softening as we see her her home life and how distraught she is over her father's alcoholism and uh, and then loses the, the wig and starts showing her own real lovely hair. And then later, you know, becomes involved with Joe Haskell after uh, Joe's time with Carolyn is a disaster. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm I'm not sure why I, I guess. I guess the writers figured that Vicky had enough to do in the story um, mm-hmm. and they needed something for Maggie to do. You know, mm-hmm. the soap opera writers were looking at it from a practical standpoint of, well, each person, each character needs to be doing something. We have to have some sort of story for her or him right. or else we don't need the character. I, th- I think it works. I mean, because Vicky is a prominent character in her own right. So it, it does, as you say, it brings Maggie into, into the story in, a, in an important way. And also Catherine Lee Scott, of course, had played the ghost of Josette prior to that uh, and bore some vague resemblance, I suppose, to the painting. I think that one of some, I don't know if it was one of the producers, directors commented on that at, at some point, but so maybe it was that too. So they, they kind of, well, she played the ghost of Josette. So let's have her be the, right. The Josette character, and very, uh, you know, that scene where she's uh, going through the the tunnels, and then she finds the secret passage that Sarah tells her about, and goes through. That's that was really scary. I mean, that's something straight out of a classic, uh, you know, Universal or a horror film. You know, it really is with the cobwebs and these tunnels that she's she's going through, and the vampires in pursuit. Oh God, what yes. a har- harrowing scene! I, I am grinning because you and I are really on the same wavelength. Several <laughs> times you have said something that I. <laughs> was just about to say, and I was oh, wow. going to say that those <laughs> yeah. scenes were as scary as anything in a universal mm-hmm. monster movie. Um, and uh, a minute ago, you mentioned the scene in which Maggie opens the coffin and tries to stake Barnabas uh, with some sort of instrument. And that was a scary moment because he sits up. And I think that's really the first time we get a, a, a full view of the fangs. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Frid tells a story of that scene when he's in, uh, when he appears in her, in Maggie's bedroom and he's holding the cane in a certain way, but then we see his face and we see something going on around his mouth. But Jonathan says that he he uh, made a mistake and put the fangs in the wrong way or upside down or mm-hmm. something. And so we didn't get the full effect of the fangs until that classic shot of the close up of uh, Jonathan as Barnabas with bearing the fangs completely. And mm-hmm. and then the next is that great chase through the tunnels, which was extremely atmospheric, as you pointed out, and could have come from a Val Luton movie or a mm-hmm. Universal movie. 
movie or anything like that. So, uh, and and then and then Vicky, of course, is uh, an able supporting player in this storyline because she's the one who stays with Maggie a few nights and is with Maggie that time when the the dogs are howling and the the yes. the doors to her bedroom are rattling. Someone yeah. is trying to get in. So. Uh, Right. So, yeah, right. that's a scary moment, too. Uh, yeah. The, and she, she beco- she's locked out. You know, she leaves the room and the bedroom door slams shut and it's locked. She can't open it. She, she can't get in. Right. And, yeah. Just really, really scary. Uh, great. Really great stuff. So Maggie, they find Maggie on the beach. Sam and Joe, uh, you know, the, Dr. Woodard played by uh, Robert Geringer, of course, was played by Richard Woods in a couple episodes. I think it was like two episodes. You had Richard Woods. Um, right. And then it was Robert Geringer, who was more well, you know, well known as Dr. Woodard. And then, of course, we had Peter Turgeon, who came in toward, toward the end of, of, of that as well. They find unusual cells in Maggie's blood. They don't know what it is. And this is actually an interesting um, thing that sort of they don't really do much in the series. But I remember Barnabas, he had the slides with Maggie's blood. And at one point, Barnabas breaks into Dr. Woodard's lab, his office, and takes the slides and he bends. You don't see it on screen, but the bars in the window are bent. So I guess this is a rare example of Barnabas displaying uh, vampiric strength. There are a couple, I mean, it's the one-handed strangle, you know, kind of, yeah. you know, certainly uh, continues through the series, but you don't see much of, of that sort of uh, behavior uh, shown by Barnabas as often. But um yeah, so uh, Do- uh, Maggie is sent to see a blood specialist that uh, Dr. Woodard talks about. And Dr. Woodard functions, I think, sort of as the Dr. Seward character, I believe. And then Dr. Right. Hoffman was supposed to be sort of the Van Helsing character who was going to come in, which was originally going to be a male character. And um, I think one of the writers mistyped the name in the script or something and set, typed Julia instead of Julian or something like that. Yes. Uh-huh. And yeah, and Dan Curtis said, well, let's let's make the doctor a woman. Uh, so Grayson Hall came into the show, another iconic character introduced into the Dark Shadows universe. And so Dr. Hoffman, played by Grayson Hall, a very unique and eccentric actress and just and had an, an inner strength where she could really stand alongside or face off against someone like Barnabas or any of the other, or Nicholas Blair, or any of these other supernatural characters that we encounter later. And she's, I guess you could say she's a mad scientist. She's not necessarily mad, but she's certainly obsessed with this idea of that she thinks she can cure a vampire. So she sort of, in a way, is villainous at first because she's, you know, her job is really to help Maggie. And she realizes that this stirring of Barnabas kind of takes precedence and of course leads ultimately to her being forced by the vampire to kill her good friend, <laughs> Dr. Woodard, or help him kill Dr. Woodard. It's a, quite a quite a dilemma she finds herself in when she gets involved with Barnabas. So thoughts on Dr. Julia Hoffman? Julia Hoffman is one of my favorite characters on Dark Shadows. And before the show ends, she essentially is one of the stars of the show. Yeah. Uh, certainly in the last year, in, in 1840 and other stories when they seem to center around her. But yes, she, uh, Barnabas changed Julia's life, the trajectory of, of her life, certainly too, because I don't think she ever would have become uh, anything like a mad scientist unless she had had this, this uh, problem to solve, this, this enigma mm-hmm. presented to her of a vampire and she looked at it in a scientific way and decided well perhaps science can cure this creature from superstition and we have that modern versus ancient folklore or science versus superstition thing going on and um, when Julia first appears she is not very sympathetic she's rather steely and stony because Mm -hmm. she she keeps uh, Sam Evans and Joe Haskell at bay and won't let them see Maggie or won't tell them how she is and she uh, stonewalls Dr. Woodard and so we see uh, the hard side of her at the beginning in later episodes, of course, famously, she can go to pieces and become hysterical, but but that isn't what's important about Julia. Uh, it's, it's her overriding strength that you mentioned that it is her quality, because even though she can become very emotional, she always, as you said, can stand up to the supernatural forces, almost all of them that she encounters, and she slaps Cassandra right. and uh, holds her own.
known with Nicholas Blair and Count Patoffi and mm -hmm. others. So um, uh, even though she does have her her hysterical moments that we remember when we watch the show, she she is a, a very strong character, as so many of the characters on Dark Shadows are: Elizabeth, uh, Carolyn, Angelique, Laura. Right, and I, I think uh, we have to you know remember that the directors on the show were directing also directing Grace and you know Leela Swift and Henry Kaplan to all the actors to play it big, you know, uh, and she, you know, as we know, the, one of, I mentioned this in the first episode, one of the characteristics of the Gothic is a heightened or overwrought emotion, you know, yes. so certainly uh, Grayson Hall uh, encapsulated that for sure. And I think Sam Hall, her husband, of course, I think he said uh, she was uh, trying to be Greta Garbo or channel Greta Garbo uh, to some extent. She's she's great. Uh, she's just a great, a great character. And of course, she ends up developing feelings for, for the vampire, which is really kind of disturbing at first, if you think about it. It's, just, it's this undead creature and she's developing feelings for him, but it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating, I think, that this that this dynamic was introduced. And Grayson Hall claims that it was her idea to do this. Uh, have you heard otherwise? I, I, that's what I've heard. No, no. Uh, I've always heard that, uh, and this is true on many soap operas, you know, uh, two actors will have just a throwaway scene together, but will suddenly have chemistry, and that mm -hmm. changes the direction of the series. Another World and other shows had that. So, uh, yes, I think uh, Grayson Hall did contribute to that aspect of the show in, in that she uh, uh, she began uh, softening as she felt sympathy for the vampire. And if that was essentially a mirror to all of us fans watching the show. We were becoming sympathetic to Barnabas and in a way falling for him and his good qualities. And she did too. And yet mm -hmm. there, there's another instance of real horror. She's She has feelings for someone and wants to help him and perhaps wants more than just a doctor-patient relationship. And yet he he's he's a creature of, of the night uh the undead and she knows almost all of the terrible things that he has done and yet she still feels compelled to give him the benefit of the doubt and to help him mm -hmm. uh i think when barnabas kills jason mcguire of course the the mcguire blackmail storyline is running concurrently with this storyline and i, I we discussed the the mcguire storyline in the last episode but also a, a great character jason mcguire played by dennis patrick and i was disappointed i remember when the mpi tapes came out because i'd watched the syndicated episodes and i remember when the first four came out they heavily edited out a lot of the jason elizabeth uh storyline i said why why did they do that and then of course they re-released them later which was i was glad about but but uh barnabas when barnabas kills jason you know jason is a really bad person so we kind of almost you know want that to happen my friend aaron was recently watching the series and she remember she was texting me and said, please tell me Barnabas kills Jason McQuire. I said, hang on. Um, so, but when they kill, when he kills Dr. Woodard, um, that's a really uh, heartbreaking moment. I think it, I can only imagine what it would have. I, I enjoyed Peter Turgeon's performance as well. I thought he would, it was an interesting alternate take on the character because at this point, I think the Collinsport Historical Society posted one of their daybook articles where they said Dr. Woodard has learned so much at this point about what Barnabas is and has seen the other side with Sarah and, and knows that the, all of this exists, that he changes as a character and that's kind of manifested in his physical appearance as well and wearing the trench coat and everything. And I kind of like that idea, but uh, I can only imagine what it would, how it would have played if Robert Geringer had been Dr. Woodard still at that point. Thoughts on that part of, of the story? Yes, um, fans point to a few of Barnabas's kills that they find really unforgivable, um, killing Carl Collins in yes. 1997 and, yeah. and um, Dr. Woodard. Perhaps the show would have suffered a little bit if Robert Geringer, uh, the established and well-liked actor playing the part, had stayed in the part until Barnabas killed him. Barnabas perhaps would have lost even more points and ground than he did. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, that, that, of course, is another stunning scene where uh, we see the bat at the window and then see one of the very best chroma key transfers of, of the Barnabas image into the room. Some of the chroma key, you know, appearing and disappearing worked 
perfectly, others not so well, but this one was one of the best. And it was it was truly scary to see Barnabas appear that way. And then to see uh, how he plunges the hypodermic into the doctor and, and kills him. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we feel for Julia, who is an accessory. She, she, right. He, he, he's sort of forcing his will on her, Julia at this time, the way he did with Maggie, because he, uh, even though she has, in a way, has the upper hand on Barnabas or has some power over him, he still has a great deal of power over her and is making her participate in this murder of someone she went to medical school with and someone right. she cares about. And there, there's at least one scene when she and Robert Geringer as Woodard are sitting in the Collinwood drawing room that is almost a flirtatious scene. Um, right. uh, perhaps the writers were wondering if that could be an angle, but right. it didn't, it didn't really go anywhere. No, they were now Julia was also a character like Barnabas. They were planning to kill Julia off as well. Uh, she was, I believe Barnabas was going to push her into a vat of acid, or she was going to fall into a vat of acid, or Barnabas was going to push her into a vat of acid. That was my understanding of what her demise was. But the character, I think I know Dan Curtis really liked uh Grayson Hall and the character caught on as well with Julia. And so she try she continues to try to cure Barnabas. And unlike in House of Dark Shadows, where Julia actually undermines Barnabas's uh, injections and he transforms into an, the old vampire in the show, it's actually Barnabas's fault because he pressures her because he wants to be with Vicky as a, as a human. Right. He uh, rushes Julia. He rushes her. Yeah. And uh, this he notices he's weakening and he doesn't like how it feels as, as he's, and he's kind of waffles on the injections and he goes back and forth on it. And uh, ultimately, you know, he pu pushes her, he wants to do this and he uh, starts aging to his true 200 years and he becomes, which is a great makeup by uh, Dick Smith. Uh, the old man Barnabas is truly a, a sight to behold. Uh, and, here. and very accurate because Jonathan Frid, as he aged, essentially aged into that makeup. Right. <laughs> some of the some of the last pictures of him look like old Barnabas. It's true. From, from the TV show, not the the no, grotesque no. movie version, but the the TV makeup really was something to see. And of course, Dick Smith went on to do Little Big Man and The Exorcist and Amadeus and won an Academy Award. So, oh. um, uh, and and if you ever see Little Big Man, Dick Smith reuses the House of Dark Shadows old Barnabas makeup in that movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre s seems to borrow that look for the grandfather character in that movie. Right. Yeah. Um, I think during um, that sequence, too, there's a there's a very poignant moment where Julia offers her blood to Barnabas. Right. Uh, and Barnabas seems genuinely moved by this, that Julia would would do this, although he then later proceeds to torment her uh he kind of goes back and forth on that too and he but then he just proceeds to torment her and there's a sort of a uh, a battle there of wills where or of uh you know trying to outwit each other julia has the the medical uh diary which she gives to tony peterson played by jerry lacy right. uh you know the, the very bogart-esque uh <laughs> jerry lacy at, at that point and uh and of course barnabas to regain his youth carolyn happens to be in the wrong place at the at the wrong time and there's that famous scene where he, he tells her uh he would never harm his own flesh and blood you know and he the old man barnabas bites carolyn and then she's in his power now carolyn becomes an agent uh for barnabas here now too uh so she's trying to get the the diary back from from tony peterson and there's this interesting sort of dynamic with julia and carolyn and tony peterson having uh the diary so any thoughts on on that sequence of events there well julia obviously feels jealousy and envy toward vicky mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh yes when when she realizes that barnabas wants vicky and no one else and that's why uh, julia starts bringing uh hypnotized vicky to the old house and showing uh, her Barnabas in the coffin. Oh yeah, me. with the with the pallor, with the green pallor. Is the lighting was so eerie in that scene? Right. I remember that. Yeah. Yes, but I think Julia off, all, also feels a jealousy and a resentment toward Carolyn because uh, uh, Carolyn, you know, has experienced something that Julia perhaps never will. 
Um, and if we were in our right minds, I don't think we would want to be bitten by a vampire, <laughs> but, sure. but her, I think maybe her emotions are taking over at this point and, and resents the fact that now Carolyn is, is a special confidant of Barnabas's. Mm -hmm. Now, how about David? Now, we brought this up earlier. Barnabas seems intent on doing away with cousin David, uh, which is uh, quite uh, disturbing. And of course, it's interesting because later Barnabas, in some way, I don't know if you can ever really redeem yourself after wanting to murder a child, but he does protect David later uh, when when we get to the Quentin's ghost storyline and then later uh, Gerard and Daphne. But the, uh, David at this point in the series, for the first almost year that Barnabas was on the show, the word vampire was never even mentioned. And I remember sitting on the edge of my seat waiting, will they ever say the word? And they didn't, they waited until 1795 when Angelique first asked Ben, do you know the word vampire? Yes. Wow, there it was. And it was very impactful, I think, when it was finally uttered because they waited so long to actually say the word, the V word, you know. Uh, but David, basically knew what Barnabas was due to say he never, you know, he just said Barnabas is dead, uh, he, you know, and uh, his friend through his friendship with Sarah, you know, he has the, the dream you, which brought you to the series, you know, uh, and uh, Barnabas wants to kill David, but they, they drop that thread later when they come back from 1795. And my theory on that was we saw Barnabas twice to my memory in the series, uh, use his hypnotic powers to erase the memories of children. The, he, Nora caught him, I believe, in the act of biting someone, and she. Yes. And uh, and then also later on, Daniel Collins walks into, I think, into the room, into Angelique's room in parallel time. That the Daniel Collins of parallel time, and Barnabas uses his hypno hypnotic abilities to wipe Daniel's memory. So I'm thinking maybe Barnabas. At that point, David was so upset about and terrified of Barnabas that Barnabas maybe couldn't get near David or get him close enough to him to, to really get him to calm down. Maybe later on, Barnabas, when we came back from 1795, maybe Barnabas did use his hypnotic abilities to, I guess I'm geeking out in kind of an in-canon way, but do you have any theories on that? Yes. Well, that's, that's a good idea. You know, um, fans love to fill in the blanks and correct mm -hmm. the inconsistencies and explain the, the plot Holes I love that the, stuff. The, I love it. <laughs> yes. And, and that's, a, that's a good explanation. I, I hadn't thought of that. But yes, yeah, so much happened on the show off stage. And, and a lot of it is referred to, uh, but much of it, we just have to infer that, well, this must have happened, or these characters must have talked, or something happened, you know, and that, that's, that's a good idea because uh, last time you talked about the Laura Collins story and how um, mm. after Laura goes up in flames, David has no memory of it. He, he just blocks it out or whatever. Mm. But yes, the writers had sort of written themselves into a corner with this idea of Barnabas wants to kill his own descendant, the the future of the Collins family, and uh, and that David knows. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you know at at different times we we are led to think that David knows, Professor Stokes knows, yes, but yeah. but it never really is is brought out into the open. So I think the one explanation is that the writers just dropped it because. By now, Barnabas is much more sympathetic. He's the star of the show, and we don't want him to harm David. And so let's mm -hmm. send David to Boston for a while. And when he comes back, all is forgotten. Mm -hmm. But I really like your idea of explaining it, of how Barnabas uh, used his influence and, and took those memories from David. It's 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 the only because we saw Julia try to hypnotize him with the medallion and he that didn't work because he had the dream where, where she had the medallion. So I was trying to it's it's I love this sort of uh, speculation about the plot, you know, and the characters and what sort of uh, filling in the blanks, like you said, and and kind of correcting the it's fun. I find that to be sort of a fun challenge or, or a puzzle. Um, and my friend Eric, who was in the first uh, or episode two, uh, wrote in with a, uh, an interesting theory because one of the things we see during this storyline, Barnabas finally reveals to Julia at Widow's Hill what happened with Jeremiah and Josette, and it doesn't match up with what we actually see in 1795. So some fans theorize that every storyline is a different 
time band is a different parallel time. I don't know if I if I'm a fan of that because I I like the idea that we're we always kind of come back to the characters we've been watching all along. I love parallel time, but that's definitely its own band of time. But I I like the idea that the the characters we started with are the characters where we see in the you know the, during the 1970 hauntings. Um, my theory was that there's so, been so much time travel and parallel time bands and Quentin's stairway into time that that time has become warped around Collinwood and, and Collinsport, such an isolated town. And time is fluid almost. The t- dates on gravestones change. And, and of course, we also have Joshua and other characters that kind of amend the Collins family history to hide certain things. So there, there's a combination of things going on. Eric wrote in uh, and suggested, uh, what if the wood, I'm going to read this if you don't mind, what if the wood of Collinwood is enchanted. Maybe there's an underground spring of magic feeding the trees in this place so the ground has been mystical for generations from even before Native Americans. And so as a result, Collinwood, made from these ensorcelled timbers, is itself a nexus of time space, harnessing the same energies as long gone temples that once stood on those grounds. Presumably both houses have this power, meaning the old house in Collinwood, but the surrounding town has been in snared in their auras. And that's why it's kind of a ghostly place set out of time. So I think that's a great theory. That That's a very good theory. Eric is onto something. And I think a little of that has been explored in the big finish mm-hmm. uh, audio dramas that paint Collinsport as uh, uh, an unusual mystical place of power and where anything can happen. Mm-hmm. But yes, that uh, some, some I've heard some fans say, well, when they come back from 1795, the relationships have changed so much, it might as well be a new parallel time. But no, I like to believe that whenever we are seeing our people in the present time, they are the same characters mm-hmm. that we saw at the very beginning when yeah. Victoria comes to Collinwood and meets Roger and Elizabeth. I, I always, in, uh, uh, as much as I loved 1795, which is one of the greatest storylines of the whole show, I was always happy when the show came back to our people in our time of Absolutely. 1960, whatever, or 1970. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, that's a that's an interesting idea because there are so many discrepancies and the, the practical side of us says, well, the writers changed their minds and needed to make changes as all TV shows do. You know, look at pilot episodes of many TV shows and there are extra characters or spouses that never appear again. But the, the more imaginative side of us could say, well, yes, uh, because in the wonderful scene uh, during the, the storm at Collinwood when Barnabas is telling the story oh, yes, yes. of Josette to Vicky and Carolyn, those facts don't gel with what we later see when the writers flesh out 1795. And even uh, the the dinner scene when uh, Maggie is in the wedding dress and she's at the table with Barnabas and Barnabas remarks that he taught Josette English. I think he says that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, some fans have said, well, Barnabas wasn't in his right mind when, when he first came out of the coffin he who would be after being in that uh state of of tortured stasis for so long sure. and so barnab a lot of what barnabas said either wasn't true or he was misremembering or purposefully telling the story a different way but as time goes on barnabas comes more back into his human self and his human mind and 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 things mm-hmm level off that way sure. and uh, and Jonathan Frid remarked about that um he uh, always said you know that he is a slow study that it takes him a long time to learn lines and uh he he did uh suffer from dyslexia to yes. a certain extent yeah but he always said you know the the other actors can look at tomorrow's script in the cab on the way home and and they know it but i okay. have to, to work for hours to to learn my lines and still can't remember every single one of them and so he said when i started on the show i was so nervous and you can see that in my performance but he says i think it ties in nicely because barnabas is nervous wouldn't yes. he be nervous after coming back into the future time of 1967 with different clothes different people machines and all of this, he he would be nervous as he navigates this new territory. And so Jonathan always said, you know, my real nervousness played into the character of Barnabas. And 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 that 
perhaps added to his allure and the unsettling nature that he brought to the character, yet another facet of his character that we saw that he was uneasy himself, and that perhaps made us uneasy and made us think more about his character and think about the characters over the weekends, as I'm sure all of us little kids did. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that that's very interesting. But uh, but mm-hmm. yes, Eric's idea is 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 very good. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, it's an interesting idea. Another another possibility too that comes into play is we know uh, Angelique was visiting the mausoleum every year. We find out in 1840 that she yes. keeps. So maybe she was uh, you know clouding his memory with black magic or or something as well, and played a role of too in that. So we're going to wrap up the the storyline, and then I want to throw out one more thing at you. The events culminate. You know, Sarah confronts Barnabas, and what a heartbreaking scene that is. Because because another thing I remember when I was watching this storyline as a child was Barnabas was desperate to see Sarah. She was appearing to everybody pretty much except for, for Barnabas. And he was desperate to, to see his, his sister again. And finally, when he is about to murder Julie, he's about to strangle Julia, the doors blow open mm-hmm. and here's this tiny little ghost child enters and finally they come face to face. And she Basically, you know, she breaks his heart. She she tells him, "I'm not coming back." She makes him recite the poem. Uh, the poem Barnabas recited, and she says, "He's forgot. You've forgotten this. What you taught me, and until you relearn it, I will never appear to you again." And she she's gone, and yes. we never do see Sarah again. Barnabas doesn't see Sarah again, so I guess he didn't fully learn the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. By the end, you know, but a- another loose end of the show. We never <laughs> see the ghost of Sarah in 1968, yeah. just as yeah. whatever happened to um, the ghost of Jeremiah when oh, Angelique yeah. raises his ghost. But we see the ghost for a while, but then he's never heard of again. So what happened to him? But um, yes. And then uh, that is a poignant scene. It, it's it's fun to talk about, but we're almost doing scariest moments from Dark Shadows. Everything yeah. <laughs> we're bringing up are some of the most affecting and atmospheric scenes. Uh, you know, it starts out with horror, with the strang- strangling and the doors opening, but then ends with with Barnabas putting his, his fists up to his eyes and crying. Yes. He, he he actually yeah. weeps a few tears and so uh that that uh, and 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 of course sarah is credited with saving julia's life you know he, mm-hmm. he doesn't kill julia and they become dear friends so yes um yeah sarah uh, is a very important character and then we we see her real human life when in 1795 when she was alive and then that uh uh, heartbreaking scene when she does die in his arms, uh, mm-hmm. done so well on both the original show and the 1991 series. Mm-hmm. So yes, um, yeah, this this is was this was his Achilles heel. You know, this is, and I even says that to Doctor Woodard. You know, loathsome I am and evil. You can mock me for that, but leave my pain alone. And Sarah yes. is his pain, and Josette, of course. So this leads to, uh, and of course, we are covering a lot of the scary moments, but there is there is a lot of there are a lot of other things happening at the same time. There's the blackmail storyline running concurrently with Elizabeth, and mm-hmm. uh, which we talked about last time. There's uh, the, the sort of the romance between Carolyn and Tony Peterson, which they uh, introduce. Uh, and there's a beautiful, uh, at one of the Dark Shadows festivals, I think Jerry Lacey wrote a, a scene where Tony Peterson and Carolyn meet many years later. At some point, Carolyn realizes, oh, this is Tony, but Tony doesn't realize it's Carolyn. And he talks about how he loved this girl. He loved her, but then he, it didn't right. happen, you know. And, and, and it, Tony Peterson is another one of those loose ends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he participates in that seance in the basement of right. the old house, but then we never see him again. Yeah. I think Adam is, tells him to, Adam sees him with Carolyn in the courtyard. Yeah. And then Adam says, get out of here. And then you never see Tony runs off. And <laughs> right. I guess Adam scared. I guess if Adam told somebody, you know, don't come back here, I guess that would be pretty intimidating. So maybe, but they, it would have been nice to have some more closure for, for that. Right. I agree. Yeah. And yeah. then of course, Adam gets the bums rush oh. at the end of his story. <laughs> yeah. But Talk about he, no closure. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I guess we can assume that Tony Peterson is a descendant of the Trasks. Mm-hmm. He, he wouldn't have to have the name Trask. Uh, it would be a, another, another family name sure. because uh, Cassandra even mentions at one point, I like using him because he yes. reminds me of someone I used to know. 
It's true. And uh, the late, great uh, Warren Onsen, uh, who used to illustrate the yes. Dark Shadows Concordances, I remember he did a, a family tree and he tried to link all the, the lookalikes, the characters, the actors who played multiple characters, he linked them in the family tree. So he did do that mm. as Tony Peterson was a descendant of, of the Trasks. And I think he did that with um, several, several characters. I think he might've linked Matthew Morgan to the, to the Stokes yeah. line and, and all of that. That was, he, I, he was so brilliant. Oh, yeah. Warren Odson was extremely talented. All of his yeah. um, illos illustrations mm -hmm. in the world of dark shadows were yeah. magnificent. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and, and yes, of course, there is a Trask in 1970 parallel time. True. You know, his yeah. name, last name is Trask. So the Trask family is present in that time as well. Yeah. Um, and so we have this storyline wraps up with, with the seance. They try to, you know, David is very troubled. They they kind, kind of come to the conclusion that they need to to contact Sarah. So, of course, they bring uh, the seance, which was, you know, we we saw in the Laura storyline. They this the, the, And then we had Barnabas the Cos had the costume party. Uh, they had the seance there. And I forgot to even mention the Burke and Jeremiah connection there. Of course, Barnabas has his sights set on Burke because he's, he reminds him of Jeremiah and there's this whole you know, scenario with Vicki Burke and Barnabas, the triangle there. Yes. Too. Um, I, I just wish Mitchell Ryan could yes. have remained with the show, but yes. uh, it was impossible for him at the time. He is fine now, but uh, yeah. it's, it's too bad he couldn't have continued. That One of his last scenes is at the Blue Whale when he handles Barnabas's cane. Yes. Uh, he, he, wants to, he asks to look at the cane and he gets a good look at the cane, but then Anthony George takes over. And although they, the two men look very similar, their approaches to the role oh, yeah. were very, very different. Absolutely. It was almost as if now Vicky is with a totally different character. Agreed. I thought uh, Anthony George was uh, really worked in the role of uh, Jeremiah. Yes. Uh, but for Burke, it was such a loss to not have Mitch Ryan continue to play the role. He was great. And it's uh, it's unfortunate that he couldn't. But it, it's really great that Big Finish did bring him back for an audio drama with Catherine Lee Scott and read all over where Burke, right. you know, uh, is in, in that story. So that's really fun. And I don't know if I consider those like canon, you know, with, but they're official. I consider them official, but kind of in the same way that I look at kind of the Marilyn Ross or the, the Gold Key comics or the Dynamite comics. It's another version of Dark Shadows, but I yes. love that the actors come back and, and do right. stories. It's, it's, it's yet another universe, yet another alternate reality. Mm -hmm. And and yes, we can believe them. I, I always loved uh, Dan Ross's novels and became mm. good friends with Dan Ross and yeah. who is now dead and his yeah. uh, wife Marilyn Ross who is, is uh, alive and well in Canada. So yeah, it's um, uh, well Dark Shadows has inspired so much creativity in 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 all of us, you know. Yeah. Watching the show got most of us interested in writing, drawing, sure. acting, history. Uh, costumes, just about anything you can think of. And uh, uh, I love time travel. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Somewhere in Time. Yeah. And and uh, I developed my love for time travel from Dark Shadows and developed my fascination with ruins <laughs> uh, uh, from Dark Shadows. Uh, yeah. Seeing Collinwood in ruins in 1995 oh, was <laughs> shocking. Oh, yes. It, it, it yeah. was one of the most shocking uh, moments on the series. And ever since then, I have been fascinated in real life with ruins. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you mentioned was uh, inspiring creativity. I used to love reading your scripts in uh, Shadows of the Night, which was a great uh, fanzine by Dan Silvio, who is still very active on, uh, on yes. Facebook. And I used to look forward to reading your scripts for the Collinsport players in that. Now, can we ever expect a return of the of the Collinsport players? If I, I wish the festivals would come back. If Jim Pearson is listening to this, please bring yes, back the festivals. Well, um, <laughs> the, the Collinsport players have have performed at every convention since the 1980s mm -hmm. uh different writers different directors some of many different fans as actors but uh, a core group who have always participated the idea for the collinsport players originated with dr laura brodian mm -hmm. uh, who uh performed skits at a Dark Shadows Convention in California. And then she and I met at the 1984 Dark Shadows Festival, the second of mm -hmm. the East Coast festivals in 1984. And we started dressing as the characters and, and doing little bits and humorous skits. 
And so the the idea continued to blossom and she and I uh, wrote more uh, plays and, and other fans began writing scripts for the Collinsport players and our costumes and our props and our music became more and more elaborate. And, mm-hmm. and so, uh, yeah, that was a, a, a fun time. And that was that was terrific that Dan Silvio in his wonderful fanzine Shadows of the Night printed yeah. some of the. Uh, others and my scripts for yeah. the Collinsport players productions. Yeah, those were, those were really fun to read. Um, last question. Okay, so Dark Shadows borrowed from many classic horror stories and films and uh, and even non-horror uh, stories of classic literature that they incorporated into the series, the writers, things that Dan Curtis liked. Uh, from what I understand, they had a, a Rolodex even of different stories that were, the, uh, Dan Curtis hired a speed reader to write synopses of, of these stories and they'd incorporate them into the show. And then one thing that always kind of, I know by the end of the series, all the major players, they were burned out. Uh, you know, Dan Curtis was burned out. He says it, said it all the time. Jonathan Frid was, uh, Sam Hall was, they, they always say we ran out of ideas. We couldn't, we couldn't think of any more ideas. And I always question that because, or, or take issue with that because I say, well, there are so many other stories you still could have pulled from to work into the show. Uh, like for example, one that comes to mind is uh, Lot 249 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is uh, an early mummy story. And yes. I know Dan, I think Dan Curtis was reluctant to do a mummy. I might be mistaken, but I think I read that in an interview that Dan Curtis was not into the idea of incorporating a, a mummy into the show. But I said, well, I think Lot 249 by Conan Doyle actually would have worked with some scholars or, you know, bringing a, a mummy to Collinsport and using, you know, the scroll to revive the mummy and do his right. bidding and things. I think it could have worked. And then another yes. one that I think could have worked is uh, Casting the Runes by M.R. James, which of course they turned into Night of the Demon. That I think right. that could have worked if it maybe kind of like the Leviathan monster where you don't see the demon or maybe a hint of the demon. But I think mm-hmm. that story could have been worked. Are there any uh, stories that you think might have worked in Dark Shadows that they didn't use? Oh, um, I can't think of any at the moment other than the mummy story, which did play a part in in Dan Ross's books and in the Gold Key comic books. And of course, years later, there was a mummy storyline on Ryan's Hope, which shot in the Dark Shadow studio. Oh, wow. But yeah, Dan Curtis loved the Universal monster movies, Dracula and Frankenstein. He was excited when they brought in all of the machinery equipment in the basement of the old house to bring Adam and Eve to life. And one of his favorite movies was The Innocents, directed by Jack Clayton. And so that's why he was eager to do that haunting of Collinwood story. And they even did it again Mm -hmm. a, a year and a half or two years later. And of course, years later, directed his own version of mm-hmm. uh, The Turn of the Screw and and found the actress who had played Mrs. Gross in Jack Clayton's film, The Innocents, yes. and, and asked her to play Mrs. Gross again for him in his movie, and, and she did. I don't know. I, I would have to think about that, but there could have been other... I think there are there there there, there, there are been, so many that they could have done. I think they were just tired of it. Yes. At that point. Yeah. There could have been other aspects of vampirism that they could have explored, or sure. magic, or the various mythologies. They did get into that with Laura, especially mm-hmm. when she came back in 1897. Sure. Um, um, so, with, but yes, but it's interesting how the show essentially goes full circle. It it begins not as a, 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 a supernatural show, but as a, a, a more traditional soap mm-hmm. opera, but with a, a with gothic mystery added to it. Right. The, the idea of, well, maybe there are ghosts and, and yeah. um, but most, uh, many of the plots at the beginning, you know, uh, are ones that you might've seen on Peyton Place or the, mm-hmm. the other daytime soap operas. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, I guess when the writers had uh, run out of ideas of supernatural monsters, the 1841 parallel time storyline goes back to more soap operatic roots in mm-hmm. terms of uh, uh, Melanie's parentage and uh, Daphne's terminal illness and right. uh, 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 Catherine's pregnancy. Those right. are the types of things we were watching on Another World and As the World right. Turns at except, that time. Except they kept, you know, the lottery, the yes. Shirley Jackson. Yes, uh, that, uh, yeah, that was a great addition yeah. using yeah. Shirley Jackson's The Lottery mm-hmm. and uh, and the and the ghost of Brutus Collins. Um, mm-hmm. Sure. As, as interesting as, as the actor who played 
played Justin Collins was, I wish that they had brought back Frank Schofield, Bill Moore. Oh, Moore. yes, I agree. I would have he, loved to have he, seen him He was again. such a, a dynamic actor. I wish he could have stayed on the show longer or come back as other characters the yes. way everybody else did. I think it would have been great when they did the the parallel time, 1970 parallel time, if if Bill Malloy was still alive yes. in the parallel time version of him. I think that would have been yes. fun. Yeah, he, he could have had essentially done everything that Chris Collins did. And later, um, mm -hmm. the uh, the character that um, I can't think of. Oh, the... uh, oh right. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Larry Chase, right? Larry. Yes, uh, uh -huh. well, yeah. Yeah, it takes over for when Chris right. uh, when uh, Don Briscoe leaves the show. Um, all, all of your listeners will will be shouting at the podcast and filling in every little <laughs> blank that that we You're right. uh, don't get exactly right. So I'm they sure will, they will write in and 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 update us. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, brought to mind when we were talking about uh, mummy mythology. The the, the Barnabas storyline does actually borrow from the Karloff mummy in the sense and the uh, with the idea that of the look alike, the long the lost yes. love from the past. But the Barnabas storyline is the first time that I'm aware of where that was applied to a vampire, where a vampire sees sort of the look alike uh, of his lost love from from the past, and then that became a state. I think Barnabas so was the cool. first time we saw that in vampire fiction and then that became a staple yeah to the right. point where we saw it in uh coppola's uh dracula yes. even in, yeah in, in curtis's own dracula sure. with, uh, that he and richard matheson did with jack palance and then of course in in uh francis ford coppola's bram stoker's dracula mm -hmm. and uh and on other tv shows you know the the idea of the look-alike or the reincarnated long lost love mm -hmm. yes uh yeah the the mummy movie did do that and uh she had an element of that and mm -hmm. and Harry Houdini uh did that in a silent movie he he mm -hmm. made a few silent movies uh when he was a, a uh, well known as a magician and in one he he plays someone from a hundred years ago or so who is frozen in the Antarctic and then comes back to life a hundred years later and meets a woman who is uh, uh, played by Nita Naldi, I believe, meets a woman who is the lookalike of uh, the woman he loved a hundred years ago. Oh, so, wow. So yeah. that's an unusual uh, little bit uh, where that idea comes out even before the Karloff mummy. Mm -hmm. But but once again, because Dark Shadows popularized it in our present time of the 60s, and because it was on television and everybody was watching, it, it really caught on. Yeah. Um, th there was an episode of Northern Exposure in which uh, Maggie, Janine Turner's character, said, um, I pretended to be sick so I could stay home from school uh, the week when, when Barnabas Collins kidnapped Maggie Evans. Oh, wow. <laughs> there several TV shows and movies yeah. have, have mentioned Dark Shadows. Or, yes, yes. Or uh, we've, we've seen clips of the show in different TV shows and movies or a poster on the wall or something. So, sure, yeah. yeah. Dark Shadows has cemented its place place in popular culture, just as much as Star Trek or Doctor Who or great literature, yeah. great comic books, uh, great movies, anything that we love and and go back to time and again and perpetuate because we we are such great fans of it. Right. And one thing you did in the uh, the the Dark Shadows comic books publication that I loved was you had a section where you talked about where comic books, where Dark Shadows, Marvel and DC and other publishers, where they reference Dark Shadows. And I, I always wished that you had continued doing that somehow and yes. updated it, you know, oh, where yes. I'm sure they've continued referencing it in other, in other comic books. And, oh, yes. So. Richard Howell, uh, an artist and writer, often puts uh, Dark Shadows uh -huh. bits into his comic books and there was an issue of marvel two in one with mm -hmm. the thing and dr strange that takes place in a town that is very similar to collinsport maine mm -hmm. and getting back to your and eric's idea dr strange even mentions uh, he says this this part of maine is known for supernatural disturbances so fantastic <laughs> so he even says that in an yeah. issue an early issue of marvel two in one fantastic well jeff i've kept you long enough it was an absolute Absolute pleasure talking with you. I'm so glad uh, that you uh, agreed to come on the show, and I'm certainly honored that you did. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it was uh, it was really great talking to you. And uh, is there anything uh, you want to let fans know uh, about upcoming uh, projects or anything that you'd like to to mention? Oh uh, well, as I said, my my three books about Dan Curtis are now in second revised second editions. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, here in the uh, Middle Tennessee area, there is uh, a magazine simply called Monster Magazine, a, a great uh, magazine done by Vance Capley and others. And in the new issue coming out, number nine, I have an article about Dan Curtis's production of Frankenstein. Oh, great. Uh, he produced it. He Someone else directed it, but he, of course, had great input at, into it as a producer. And Robert Cobert does the music. But I've, I've seen the proofs of Monster Magazine number nine, and there are many wonderful photographs, uh, some of which I had never seen before, of, oh, of wow. Frankenstein that uh, Monster Magazine has woven into my text uh, very artistically. So um, I'm excited about that. And um, oh, um, I, I have other writing projects going. And, and like you pointed out, the, the Hermes Press books that reprint the mm -hmm. Dark Shadows comic books, as well as the newspaper comic strip, which ran from 1971 to 72, mm -hmm. and even the one-shot Dark Shadows Story Digest magazine. Yeah. So I wrote the introductions to those eight books available from Hermes Press. And, and if you get on Hermes Press's email list, uh, Hermes Press often sends out notices of sales of 20% off or even 25% off. So yeah. you can you can pick up those books very easily and, and other books that reprint The Phantom and Dick Tracy and Flash oh. Gordon and The Time Tunnel and, and other favorites. And they're really beautiful books. They're high quality books uh, and well worth uh, well worth it. I, I have all the the gold key collections. I have to digest and the um, newspaper strips as well. And it's fantastic that they were able to acquire the Sunday color strips because I know uh, Pomegranate Press uh, had put out a book of and I have that one too. But the Sundays were in black and white. But this one mm -hmm. has the color Sundays, and those are were difficult to find from what I understand. So yes. glad they did find them. Yeah, the um, book was delayed. For for a, a couple of years because Dan Herman and uh, others at Hermes Press were searching libraries and microfilm and, and college uh, collections and things like that to find all of the missing strips. Wonderful. I'm glad they did. Well, Jeff, thank you again. And join us next time for Terror at Collinwood. And remember, Terror, Terror at Collinwood is a Dark Shadows podcast. I, st I still haven't come up with a good closing line, Jeff, for the end of the show. Any ideas? I have to. I have to come up with a good line. I have, I've had people write in with suggestions mm -hmm. for a closing line. So if you are listening and you have a good closing line for the podcast, send it to me at terror at Collinwood, one word at gmail.com. I'm going to post all the suggestions on Facebook. So whoever uh, sees it on Facebook, wh whoever wins, you're going to be the one whose closing line is used. And I will send you something cool in the mail, a little, a little something for your efforts. So terror at Collinwood at gmail.com. Thank you again, Jeff. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Penny. The pleasure is all mine. I have really enjoyed our talk. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Hello, denizens of Collinsport. Just a couple of quick things here. I want to thank the Collinsport Historical Society and Wallace McBride for sharing the podcast on the Collinsport Historical Society website. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. So thank you so much for doing that. Also, if you happen to be listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, please take a couple of seconds to rate and review the show. If you scroll down to the bottom, after you listen to the episode on the app, you'll see a series of stars. There are five stars there. You just click on the number of stars you want to give the show, and then you can even type a little quick review uh, if you enjoyed it, and you, then you submit it. And the reason for this is that it actually helps the podcast show up more frequently in searches on search engines. It also helps the podcast to come up as a recommended podcast. It really does actually help the podcast quite a bit. So for fellow Dark Shadows fans to find it more easily if they don't know about it, this actually actually does help the podcast to be found. Now, another thing, uh, I have recently added the podcast to a number of other podcast apps. So you can now find it on Audible through uh, Amazon Music. You can find it on Pocket Cast. You can find it on several podcast apps. I'll post a list on my uh, Facebook if it helps. If it's not on your podcast app, your favorite app, drop me a line at terror at Collinwood at gmail.com and I'll see if I can submit the RSS to that uh, service. Thank you so much.